The convoy of four helicopters flies toward the mountain. The search and rescue team on board one, local lawmen and our camera crew on another, plus some smaller choppers to act as aerial scouts in the attempt to locate the missing family. The pilots stay in constant contact with the ground base as they head toward the search area. First, we fly over the lush green forests and clear lakes of western Washington, unaffected by the fallout from the eruption. About 20 miles from the volcano, we spot the first dramatic evidence of the blast, a layer of ash blanketing the landscape, abruptly transforming it from green to gray. Then, 15 miles from the crater, we begin to fly over land that has had all the life blasted out of it. 150 square miles of timber once valued at $200 million. Trees six and eight feet in diameter were pulled out of the ground, stripped of bark branches and leaves and toppled like children's pickup sticks. The choppers search and circle as they travel. The 35 mile flight to the mountain slope takes almost 50 minutes. Finally, the helicopters locate today's search site a mountain ridge just three miles north of the volcano's new crater. The pilots find stable patches of ground large enough to allow a safe landing. Deputy Hill and Hauser are first off the helicopter. They will lead the advanced team of searchers. This party will go ahead to try and find the mining camp where the missing people lived and worked. Ducking to avoid the still spinning blades, the men move away from the copter and gather on a knoll. They then face their first big problem, simply finding out where they are. This country is ruined so bad that the landmarks on the map and what you have out here is absolutely two different things. The searchers set out and immediately encounter the problems of moving on the ground. Trees that look like tinder from the air turn out to be six to ten foot high obstacles that must be scaled, scrambled over. What was once a magnificent forest has become an obstacle course of huge proportions. To qualify for this kind of rescue work, a man should be able to walk 30 miles a day. These men will walk a mile and a half today. At the end, they'll be exhausted. Once, deer, bobcat, cougar, bear, and elk roamed this wilderness. Now there's no life within a 15-mile radius of the crater. The only movement is the search team. The only color, the gray ash. The only sound, the helicopter, which points the searchers in the right direction. Right now, the search and rescue party has gotten far ahead of us. They're up on the side of the mountain now at the site of an old gold mine where they believe three people may have sought shelter right after the eruption. The ash and muck is four feet deep in places covered with a thin crust that breaks at the slightest touch. The ash itself covers three feet of snow on the mountain. When wet, the stuff pulls at the boots of the men. When they use a fallen log as a bridge to cross a ravine or as a stairway, the wet ash makes the surface slick and dangerous. Before the eruption, Elk Lake was a major landmark here. The force of the blast blew all of the water out of the lake and filled it with mud and debris. Elk Lake just doesn't exist anymore. The men are looking for a piece of mining equipment, a compressor they know must have been near the mine entrance. Okay, we're, uh, we're approaching the uh, compressor at the mine. Can you give us an approximate location of the uh, cabin from the mine? If they're in the right place, maybe, just maybe, someone may still be alive there. Okay, they threw a dead end spur to come out, and then they walk right off that spur into mines. We're, we're right there. We're, we're within, uh, like I say, you know, everything's covered in mud. Oh, God. These guys are standing outside. They could be under 30, 40, 50 feet in mud. Pick up 